Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Emily Moyer and this is words number 36. And despite the fact that there are probably plenty of political and uh, social and media nonsense topics that we could yammer on and on about today, we're choosing to ignore that to welcome our second guest to the podcast. And Danny Katz is here with me and she's gonna tell you a little bit about who he is and how she met him. Well, um, our guest is the one and only Robert Fort, who I am so blessed to have by way of the internet a few months ago. We met on a thread and uh, there was whatever was happening on the thread. And then Robert messaged me privately with a less popular opinion that opened my heart and, and showed me that, oh my God, we're on the same page. This person's a critical thinker. Um, so since then, we've had some email exchanges and some phone conversations. Robert is a luminary and a scholar in the psychedelic movement from back in its early days. He's also a comparative religious scholar. He's also a, a brilliant, awake human. And I'm so stoked, Robert, that you agreed to come onto our show and talk to us. Well, thank you. It is my pleasure because I've been in a process of um, looking for people like you guys who can help um, kind of take apart and understand what's really going on <clears throat> um, currently with this psychedelic renaissance, but also the whole broader movement of how and why these powerful drugs became um, so popular in our culture beginning in the 1950s. And, um, you know, as Emily said in the beginning, when we were talking, we're, we're each of them, um, well, we are of slightly different generations. I think I'm, um, what, am, what am I, 15 years older than you guys? Something like that. And I was, um, I was born in 1956. And I became really quite fascinated with these drugs, even when I was just about um, 10 years old. I didn't take them, but they were, they were part of our society. And I was first um, kind of alarmed by them because um, the effects that I saw on the kids in my high school were not particularly good. You know, kids that were um, kind of mainstream, normal kids, I was sort of a jock. They would get into these substances and they would get kind of weird and kind of lose their way. So I first had a kind of negative opinion about them it wasn't until I went to college in my third year of college and I'd begun to study religion that I became aware that actually these drugs had a very important historical significance in the origin of religion and that the modern movement of psychedelics had a great deal of um, powerful and unique uh, therapeutic breakthroughs and therapeutic applications. <clears throat> so I decided almost overnight that I was going <clears> to <throat> learn everything I could about these drugs and kind of make a <clears throat> career out of it as a scholar and as a researcher. And so I did that beginning in about 1980. And I threw myself into the subject um, more than just about anybody I know. I mean, I was, um, it was during a time where there was a real lull in psychedelics. You know, they reached a peak in the late 60s and early 70s, and then they sort of petered out. There was no more research going on. There were no classes. There were very few books, new books being published. So I just went around and contacted these people who had been instrumental in the first wave and was welcomed by them and apprenticed myself with them and developed close relationships with um, many, many of the most significant people. And so I've always, I've kind of seen myself as a bridge between the first generation of the 60s, people like Leary and Gordon Wasson and Albert Hoffman, who I knew personally quite well, each of those people, Alexander Shulgin, and this new generation of um, younger people who were starting to get, become fascinated. And I, and I just, um, that's where I am now. Awesome. You know, I, when Danny first told me about you, I started looking a little bit and, and I realized very quickly that we had a lot in common and that I didn't want to look, I didn't want to listen to a lot of the other stuff that you had done or do too much research because I wanted to sort of let the conversation unfold naturally. And I too was very, um, had a negative view of 
like of, of drugs, right? You know, even though I always also was attracted to some of the visual imagery that was portrayed around them in the media, right? When you would see like an article or a book about psychedelics or about drugs, there was usually like a very colorful graphic, right? With something that's like an optical illusion or something very psychedelic looking, right? And, uh, you know, cool, cool young people or whatever. While like those visuals grabbed me, the behavior I saw from like my peers or people, you know, kids you knew at school or heard about or whatever also made me have harsh judgment of it. I too was a, a jock, <laughs> right, or an athlete. I was a gymnast and whatnot. And so, you know, that was kind of a no-no. So I had, you know, a pretty similar kind of thing. And it wasn't until gymnastics ended for me after a few years into college, as well as you, that I kind of started just dabbling in waters outside of your typical, like, jock type of life and um, began to experiment with a variety of kinds of things. And um, once I found my way to psychedelics, my experience of them was different than what I had judged they might be based on the behavior I saw of peers like in high school, right? You know, and I guess at the time, I didn't spend that much time thinking about it, like in hindsight, especially because I spent a lot of years in the rave scene and the underground dance music party scene, I still go to underground parties, um, but back in the like rave days, you had a lot of very young people there. And by the time I was really into it, I, was not, I wasn't on the super young end of that. And I think at a certain point I, I came to see that they have a very different effect on you once your brain is like matured past a certain point. I, don't, I didn't start doing psychedelics till my mid twenties. And I think that like, it's a completely different experience than when you have it, you know, as a teenager, my stepbrother did a lot of psychedelics as a kid and he just always had that wandered off sort of look in his eye and couldn't ever quite get it together. So um, yeah, that's kind of, you know, we had some of that in common. And um, I, I like the way you described yourself as sort of a bridge between the various generations. Um, from what I did gather from some of the things Danny told me and what I kind of looked into, like when I think of like the previous generations, a lot of them like in hindsight, they, they see everything from their generation as having either been wonderful right? Like, oh, it's just the wonderful days. And if everything went back to that, things would be fine. Or if they have a negative view of it, they think the cause of the problem was, you know, the drugs, the drugs themselves as a, never really looking at the fact that there could have been some other kinds of influences and manipulation going on. And we see some of those same things in the more modern one. We're still in process of that though. So it's a little unclear. You're kind of unique in that you kind of stake out a position of um, you know, that there's problems, but it's not necessarily the substances themselves. So I was really looking forward to this. Danny, uh, what are your thoughts on, on some of that or your, your, your position coming uh, into this? Yeah, my, my position coming in is I've, I'm noticing myself contract around the word drugs. Okay. Because drugs <laughs> is so laden with all those things. And granted, like not everything is a plant. LSD is not a plant. Right. Um, and, you know, so I tend to use the terminology plant and medicine. And I know, Emily, you want to talk about these substances as medicine. So I just kind of wanted yeah. to presence that and give voice to that. And yeah. I have the same background as Emily. I was a gymnast. Drugs were a total no-no. I went to the biggest party school in the country and never tried anything. Um, the first substance, substance I did was in graduate school. I did LSD. And when I did, I thought, oh, okay, now suddenly this dimension makes sense and I can be on the planet. It was not until I did psychedelics that I felt like I could function in this culture. Um, and I do credit psychedelics with a lot of, of my growth and my knowledge and my spiritual connection and whatnot. That being said, having been in the psychedelic community for as long as I have, I see a lot of the downsides. I see a lot of the group think. I see where it takes some of our best and brightest minds and completely co-ops them and distracts them and takes them away from themselves. I also see how, you know, the current iteration and even, you know, the generation that you were speaking of, Robert, seems to be led by a lot of dudes, which I find interesting. Um, and like anything, when there's a big sort of movement around it or a group or a tribe or an identity, I tend to sort of step away and get suspicious. And right now my perspective on it all is more of a, especially as we're getting into the legalization conversation, 
-hmm. that's kind of where I'm at. Bro broad overview. Cool. Yeah. Well, okay. So let me say a couple of things. First of all, it's, it's an enormously complicated subject with many, many levels. And so I'm, I'm now talking about not um, the psychedelic movement, but psychedelic movements. Yep. There's more than one. There's more than one current of activity going on here since um, these drugs were introduced. And I'd like to just, as a starting point, I, I will say um, it was with Albert Hoffman's discovery of LSD. Okay, and um, the the history of psychedelic drugs. Let's just say from that point is really, um, to my mind, a microcosm of the history of religion. Now, religion we know is vast and enormously complex and includes the entire uh, spectrum of human behavior from the very best, you know, our ideas of enlightenment and human fulfillment and ethical systems and all of the really great stuff that is in this history of religion. And at the same time, there's the opposite and how often religion is used as a tool of tyrants for mind control and the uh, subjugation of populations, and um, you know the very the very worst, preying on people and controlling them. And um, contrary to what um, a lot of psychedelic enthusiasts have been led to believe, the the um, evolution of psychedelic drugs in modern society, again starting in the 40s or 50s, <clears throat> was not an organic um, coming together of disparate events. Uh, Albert Hoffman's discovery of LSD, uh, Aldous Huxley's um, taking mescaline and writing The Doors of Perception, Gordon Wasson, the banker who um, sort of discovered or introduced the mushroom into the modern world, um, Timothy Leary's um, adventures at Harvard, uh, Ken Kesey, and, um, and then this whole body of psychiatric research that had begun in the 40s and 50s. This, this was not just these things sort of happening independently, then leading into this phenomena, but these were actually uh, kind of planned and coordinated events. Yep. And this is a kind of, this is a disturbing thing, and I'm, I'm, um, I'm just really starting to come out and talk more about this because uh, I think it's really very important and I have to deal with a lot of flack. You guys probably get this too. You know, you get to be called a conspiracy theorist. And I think you've, co I think you've covered this meme in earlier podcasts and so maybe we should go over it a little bit, but, but really beginning in the 1940s and 50s, American, modern society, not just American, but European society, we were subject to an op. We, we were subject to a, a form of social engineering. These drugs were deliberately introduced in order to have an effect. The effect was not the evolution of consciousness, but it was the, it was the control of consciousness. Yeah. And so uh, this, was a, this was kind of, um, I, when I first got into the subject, I, was, I just naively accepted the official story. And it wasn't until uh, you know, 20 or 25 years later of really concerted activity, you know, and we can talk about some of these things that I, that I did, um, that I began to realize, huh, I've been tricked here. That even some of these people who I looked up to and admired as my teachers or mentors, and I felt very privileged to be part, to be welcomed into their lives, they were actually working on a secret project. And um, I think we ought to flush out some of that. So real quickly, Robert, I definitely want to flush that out. When you first approached these people, like in 1980, beginning in 1980, and they took you in, what was their like explanation or their story to you as to how they fell upon this, right? Like, did they, like, I, my guess would be that like, they didn't tell you the absolute truth upon first meeting that you got some sort of, like, or, or do you think they were being tricked too? And they felt like they had had an, uh, an organic experience and later you realized not only did you not, but they didn't, or, or, or were they lying to you from the very beginning? 
Um, <clears throat> some of the, the, it's um, not always the same with each person. So maybe if I just told a certain, like, like a story about one yeah. or two of these people, we could get into it. Me yeah. personally, I was, a, uh, I was a third year student studying um, the history of religion at uh, Columbia University in New York. And I became aware of, um, you know, the oldest body of writings in history of Indian religion is the Vedas. Mm -hmm. And the oldest of the Vedas is called the Rig Veda. And the Rig Veda is almost solely about the collection of a, a plant called Soma mm -hmm. and um, the ceremonies and the visions that this plant would provide. And uh, our professor at Columbia, I remember he wrote on the board, Gordon Wasson was, uh, had introduced a theory that this, that Soma plant was a hallucinogenic mushroom. I remember sitting there in the class in this kind of what a mushroom those things that kids did and you know that there's this rich historical significance to it i gotta check this out and so um that was my first inkling i um became a very um thirsty reader i read i don't know how many dozens of books over the next few months about this <clears throat> It was time for me to move to California to finish my undergraduate degree. And there I became lucky to become a student of a fellow named Frank Barron. Now people don't, he's not a very well-known name in the like public about psychedelics, but he's really one of the most significant figures in the whole movement because he and his, um, he initiated his graduate school friend, Timothy Leary. Frank Barron and Tim Leary went to Berkeley together and did their PhDs. And Frank had the mushroom first and introduced it to Tim. And the two of them started the Harvard project in, 19, in 1960. Why don't I just turn this off now? And so Frank and I became close and he, um, he really encouraged me to look into this. And um, I'm pausing here because this is, there's, a, I'm not sure, but it's possible that Frank was also working on a secret project. Mm -hmm. Frank, Frank Barron, um, the Institute of Personality Research and Assessment at Berkeley was, um, was largely funded by um, intelligence, OSS, in World War II, when it disbanded, it kind of split into three entities. It became the CIA in Washington. It became the Department of Social Relations at Harvard, and it became the Institute of Personality Research and Assessment at Berkeley. See, I'm realizing as I'm talking about this, maybe we should even step back a little bit and okay. that to really, um, get what I'm putting out, we have to really reframe a lot of what we think of about American history in the post-war period. For example, it's a common understanding that the Allies defeated the Nazis in World War II. Okay, so that's the, the actual history of World War II and the post-war period is a lot more interesting than that that the Nazis weren't actually defeated. There was, a, there was a, um, an impasse in the war and the Nazi intelli intelligence apparatus snuck over here into the United States and became the CIA. The battlefield shifted. We were no longer dropping bombs on European cities, but it became a kind of psychological war. The, the, the enemy, to the Third Reich was the American spirit of independence and democracy. And they began to try to whittle away at that. First, they whittled away at it by setting up what was known when the CIA was officially formed in 1947. One of the very first operations of the CIA was Operation Mockingbird, mm -hmm. which is a funny little name for their infiltration of uh, American media. Yep. And not just American media like the TV stations, 
but American media in terms of publishing and university placement of faculty. And they really wanted to begin to socially re-engineer American consciousness to, in order to pave the way for uh, fascism. Okay. Yeah, Robert, real quickly before you go on, like obviously our audience knows a lot about Operation Mockingbird and whatnot, but I, I, I'm glad that you said about publishing and I wanna direct people's attention specifically to university publishing, right? So people think about it in terms of the CIA has an operative in the newsrooms, like the big ones, they also have them in some smaller local ones, they're at the newspapers and the big magazines, but I've become increasingly suspicious of the, pre of the publishing and the presses associated with various universities that publish people's, you know, um, doc doctoral works and things like that, right? Because I'm watching, um, and this is a little bit of an aside, but if you're familiar at all with like the, the Phoenix program and stuff, like a lot of the, that went on at Michigan State University. We also had Michigan State University being the hub of the pedophilia activity around USA Gymnastics. And they're also oddly prominent in um, publishing books, scholarly books about things that uh, sound like, um, like racial justice, but are also causing racial division. Right. And so like this, like, why is it that the center, right? And there's been stuff published through these things about all of this stuff. And people don't generally think about that, right? There are publishing presses associated with universities. And so when you said publishing, I just wanted to say that, like, like, you know, we all know about the newsrooms, but it goes much, much deeper than that. And so if we're looking at professors, we're also looking at the publishing associated with them, right? Yeah, yes, exactly. You know, and people oh. get, <clears throat> people are very offended when you begin to enter this conversation. Um, you know, Americans particularly, we've been, um, we have this idea of American exceptionalism, right? And it's the same, it causes a lot of cognitive dissonance to be faced with the um, possibility that the country that you um, are a citizen of is actually a kind of hostile force to you. People encounter the same thing, like if you're gonna explore, um, you know, child sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. The same thing. It's just like these, you know, like whoa, whoa, whoa. And so to really, really get in and understand the what we're what we're trying to talk about today, you have to really um, practice great methodology and put your emotions aside and look at the data, look at the research, and um, and uh, just try to stay neutral with this. And um, so. Um, so where were we? The, Robert, um, can I ask you a question real quick? Yes. Um, just tying into to, to where you were leading us. Um, when you were talking about the history, you were saying that the Nazi party didn't actually lose the war. They instead infiltrated through the CIA. So my question is, is it the Nazi party acting as an independent Nazi party or was there something else acting through the Nazi party? Yeah, the Nazi Party itself was kind of put forth by um, by the, uh, by you know British British and, intelligence. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And th this is not really my forte. <laughs> Emily's I would, so recommend, I would recommend that you that in one of your next podcasts you get one of my colleagues and good friends Joseph Atwill to talk more about this this origin of the Nazi Party. But that was that was also kind of a you know a psyop against the German people. You know, Hitler was kind of propped up to be this, you know, savage guy who could then be, appear to be taken out. And then the, the, the conquering force, you know, is valorized. It's sort of the same thing, this pattern we see with uh, Noriega being put in power in Pentagon or Samosa or Saddam Hussein. You know, these were, these were props and puppets put up by the forces that then ended up taking them out, and Hitler, Hitler was one of those guys. But yes, there's there's a deeper, yeah. darker, deep state. Yeah, the, 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 to yeah. me, um, to me, like, and it, it's interesting that you say this now. All of my sort of recent threads, right, keep leading me to the spot that like 
people have forgotten about like the British intelligence aspect of things. Everything is, oh, it was the Nazis or, oh, it's now it's, oh, it's the Russians or the Chinese or whatever. Very little is paid to att paid attention anymore to the Brits and they still are creating the James Bond plot that we're all living in. <laughs> As yeah. well, Janet Osabards, I might be mangling her name, her new sequel to The Fall of the Cabal, she, she goes through all of this and ties Hitler to the Rockefellers and back to the Gazars, which you and I have been talking about before, Emily, and I just kind of wanted to see where you were at with it, Robert. Um, thanks for letting me interrupt your flow. <laughs> yeah, yeah th 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 this is all... Um the like, British intelligence kind of stuff on like some of this more governmental letter level and on the social level, like very Tavistockian. Tavistockian, yes. Yeah. So that's a big subject. Now, me personally, I've, I've read a lot of that. I'm not entirely satisfied with the scholarship and the research on Tavistock. And I really would hope that more historians and social scientists would get would get into that and come up with more convincing material. I don't disbelieve it, but I but I'd like to know more. Yeah. Certainly certainly when you look at this, there are a lot of there are a lot of signals that go back to Tavistock. And um, and some of the prominent people in the psychedelic movement have connections to them. But in my own my own story, so I um, I I got to know Gordon Lawson. Uh, he was a kind of reclusive sort of guy, but I, I was just uh, lucky and reached out to him. I was spending a little time in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I decided to organize a, uh, a conference in the Divinity School at Harvard. And so I brought together <clears throat> um, a couple of dozen of the most prominent psychedelic people and that's how I met Gordon Wasson. <clears throat> he welcomed me into his life. I was a smart young kid and I was a guest in his home. He, he invited me to actually live there with him and his um, caretaker to prepare for the um, transfer of his archives to Harvard. I didn't actually do that but I made several visits with Wasson and um, and again, I thought I was just really uniquely privileged to have this proximity to this great man. He was like the, the Moses of the psychedelic movement. Now, should I just, should I just sketch out who Wasson was for our listeners? Sure, so, yeah, I mean, I think okay. there's, a good, there's a good amount of them that will be familiar on a certain level with Gordon Wasson, and then there's others that, uh, that not, not at all, so yes, please. Okay, so it was a kind of ironic bit of history that this modern psychedelic movement, one of the most important events was um, Gordon Wasson's research. Um, and Gordon Wasson was a banker. He was an amateur scholar. He was a wall, we kind of knew that Gordon Wasson was a Wall Street banker and how ironic that a Wall Street banker would be the guy to kick off this psychedelic movement. When you look a little closer, as I have at Gordon Wasson, he wasn't exactly a banker in that he dealt with pension funds or interest rates or money per se even. He was a guy who was into public relations. He was actually a propagandist for JP Morgan. And JP Morgan, yeah, that's a bank, but it's really more like a political force and a fascist political force. You know, Morgan was a, was a supporter of, of the Nazi party and the concentration of wealth and so on. And Wasson was his, um, a vice president dealing with public relations. And um, Wasson used to tell that his mushroom hobby was separate from his banking career. Mm -hmm. And he made that very clear to me. Um, in a, you know, I, I actually published a long interview with Wasson. And so some of the things that we're just gonna kind of skirt over here are referenced and written down in my books that we'll list at the end of the podcast. But um, in my interview with Wasson, he said that um, he kept the banking and the mushroom work completely separate. But several years later, when I was going through his archives, I found out that he was misleading me, that in fact, he had conversations and correspondence with some of the most um, important banking colleagues and friends of his that were and I began to realize, well, Gordon Wasson wasn't really just a Wall Street banker, but he was really on the very inner circle mm -hmm. of the American fascist movement. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, he's close friends and drinking buddies with people like Alan Dulles, mm -hmm. who was the uh, first director of the CIA, who was the director of a bank in Switzerland that helped finance Hitler. You know, Alan Dulles is one of the darkest characters in modern American history. A really great book by David Talbot, The Devil's Chessboard, gets into a lot of the details about Alan Dulles. He was one of the founders of MK Ultra, which is really what we're talking about here. Yeah. MK Ultra stands for mind control, control with a K like the German, ultra mind control. Mm -hmm. That was what they were beginning to institute in America. You mentioned MK Ultra nowadays, and people think that MK Ultra was just a um, this nefarious program of really diabolical experimentation on unwitting subjects prostitutes, giving them to their johns, you know, some of these very celebrated things that they did. But MKUltra was really a lot more extensive than that. And, um, and so, so Watson kind of kicks off the psychedelic movement with an article that he, wrote, that he publishes in Life magazine mm -hmm. in 1957. And it was um, called um, Seeking and Finding the Magic Mushroom. Before this article, these psychedelic mushrooms were known to a few people, anthropologists, very small number of people. When Wasson wrote this article, it became literally front page news in one of the most popular periodicals in the world. And suddenly everybody knows about the existence of this mushroom that causes visions. And um, it was one of the turning points in my career of understanding these drugs, that that article was itself an MK Ultra subproject. Yeah, that art. That article was um, paid for. The, the the expedition was paid for by the CIA. The publication of it was paid for by the CIA. Henry Luce, who was the uh, owner and publisher and editor of Life magazine and many others, was himself not formerly in the CIA, but he's a skull and bones guy. And um, that, was, that was really kind of astonishing to me and kind of personally offensive because Wasson had, this gets back to your earlier question, he deliberately misled the culture and me in particular when I asked him about this. So when you're, when you're telling me this and you're talking about how he, you met him in Cambridge and he kind of took you in and whatnot, this is like, almost word for word, similar to how Ted Kaczynski was taken in by one of his professors at, in Cambridge at Harvard. And, you know, he would have weekly visits with him and whatnot. And he thought he was a special chosen one. And really he was having MKUltra executed on his mind at a very high level, right? Like, yeah. the most, you know, like I just recently, a few months ago, watched the um, Netflix Unabomber documentary, which has all the usual problems of a Netflix documentary. I'm not endorsing the veracity of the story that they put out there. But one thing that they did actually cover was, it felt like they did a decent job at showing what was really going on with his professor at Harvard there. Um, and, you know, like, I think that um, in that period, now, now things are a little different because we have technology and the way people are reached and mentored to or mind controlled or whatever tends to involve a technological intermediary often. Or the other way it's happening right now is a lot of times like through like a guru of meditation or yoga or, or, or whatnot, right? But back in that period of time, it very much was like the student teacher, you know, elder, younger sort of relationship and making that person feel special and trust you, right? And um, the um, betrayal there and the, the deviousness and the really darkness of taking advantage of the really special thing that a relationship like that is supposed to be does yeah. isn't lost on me, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I think that um, uh, that in, in some ways, even though that sounds a lot less violent than some of the awful things we've heard about MKUltra, because that's been the main topic of my work since the very beginning has been mind control and whatnot. I think this is the one where the most actual damage to a psyche of a person happens, right? When like a person is 
through this trusted mentorship or apprenticeship kind of relationship led down a path that um, affects every part of their development, socially, psychologically, neurologically, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, I'm glad you said that because that is part of what I'm, that's one of the things that I've been working my way through. You mentioned Ted Kaczynski at Harvard. So that program that uh, Kaczynski was subjected to was under a fellow, a very important character in American psychology, Henry Murray. Mm -hmm. And Henry Murray was previously with OSS. And when I said that OSS came into Harvard and Washington and Berkeley, that was Henry Murray at Harvard. Yeah. Henry Murray is also, was also my professor, Frank Barron's mentor mm -hmm. and close friend. And it was Murray who brought Frank Barron to Harvard. Mm -hmm. and, and it was, and those guys then brought Leary to Harvard. Now, again, this, it's not a straight linear thing because Frank, I loved Frank Barron and I really feel like he loved me and, and took me in as a son. Not, not only was I his student for several years formal or two years formally at the university, but we maintained a relationship for the next um, 20 years. We would have lunch frequently and, um, you know, a really brilliant and interesting and wise person. And I think that it's possible with Frank, as I'm quite sure it was with Tim Leary, who I hope we talk about in this conversation, that these guys became aware that they were being used by social engineers mm -hmm. and they woke up to it. They recognized that this is, this is when this psychedelic mind control operation began to bifurcate a little bit. And Tim Leary and Frank Barron started another psychedelic movement. Mm -hmm. The first psychedelic movement that they started was sort of like what Aldous Huxley had warned about in Brave New World, mm -hmm. right? Huxley writes Brave New World in 1937, I think, about a future society where uh, the wealth is controlled by a small number of people. It's a military industrial dictatorship and the, but the mass of the population doesn't do anything politically. Why not? Well, because whenever they get a little um, uh, anxious about their fate, they're given this uh, psychedelic drug. We didn't have the word psychedelic drug at that point, but it was yeah. a drug that gave you a kind of quasi mystical experience, um, made you feel like everything was okay, even mm -hmm. when everything was not okay. You would go on these soma holidays and you would take these drugs and you would be instructed to fuck your brains out not establish any kind of meaningful relationship but just kind of fuck your brains out now who wants to start a revolution after you've just had after you've just come back from burning man you know <laughs> kind of like that and so that's what they were setting out to do in, yeah. diff in different ways and frank and tim this is this is the story that I believe is true. They realized that they were being used and they started to wake up to it and they started to use the same psychological data and the same drugs and started like a counter revolution mm -hmm. and used started to introduce these drugs in order to wake people up and to empower people. And then there was a lot of chaos in the 1960s and 70s and I one of the ways that I put it is that was a period of chemical warfare in the United States with each side using the same drugs, but with different means and different intentions. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we all know Tim Leary is the guy who, you know, popularized these psychedelic drugs, but really the abiding theme throughout his life was more important. It was about questioning authority mm -hmm. and thinking for yourself. <laughs> and that um, because the difference between a democratic society and a fascist society has to do with the location of power in right. a fascist society, the, the, the citizenry is weakened. The power is all introduced to the state. In a democratic society, the power is the locus of authority is within each and every person. And that's what that's what enables a democracy to flourish. And that's what Tim and Frank were trying to do with the drugs. Now, if you look at today's 
renaissance of psychedelics, you see a couple of very interesting things. One is that there are always this flood of articles in the mainstream news, the New York Times and The Economist and uh, you know, CNN, psychedelic drugs are coming back. They're great for you if you do them in the context of psychiatric approved you know, medical research. You know, they're, they're trying, and they all, they all take a shit on Leary mm -hmm. as the guy who ruined this movement. Well, he did ruin that movement. He did ruin the um, attempt of the CIA to use these drugs as a new form of SOMA. I have, um, I have some documents. Well, I, I don't know if I still have them. You know, I just experienced a house fire and my whole archives were, were lost, but uh, somewhere I still have a document of Tim, one of these classic articles where they're saying, oh, Tim Leary ruined research. This guy, Rick Doblin, you know, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we have to erase the ghost of Timothy Leary. And um, that was actually what Tim was proudest of. He said many times in his life, his most important contribution was wrestling the drugs away from the CIA. And he was kind of a, he was kind of a flawed hero in that regard, but. Um, okay. Do you so think that Doblin said that in good faith or do you think Doblin said that as part of some other sort of fuckery? I think Doblin said that as some other sort of fuckery. And I, I, have, a, I have quite a history with Rick Doblin because um, Doblin got his first MDMA um, from me. I was, I had, um, I had gotten to know Alexander Shulgin in the early 1980s. I had my first MDMA when I was uh, at Esalen on Halloween in 1981 and um, was very impressive. And um, Tim told me that if you wanted, I said, I wanna know everything about this drug. He said, well, the guy you gotta talk to is Alexander Shulgin. And so I, hitchhiked up from Big Sur to Berkeley to go meet Shulgin, who was uh, teaching at Berkeley at the time. And I introduced myself as uh, I was working with Stan Groth at the time at Esalen. And I said, I'm just wanting to learn everything about psychedelic drugs. And I had um, an MDMA experience. And it seems to me to be the perfect drug to reintroduce into society because it's gentle. It doesn't have the, the negative side effects or, you know, uh, overwhelming nature of LSD. And I'd like to begin to work with this. And he said, well, how can I help you? And I said, well, um, can I have some more? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I think you're frozen up a bit, Robert. Hold on. Let's see what's happening here. Robert, can you hear us? I can hear you. Yes. Okay, you froze up a little bit after you said, "Can I have some more?" Which I think is always the perfect, <laughs> the perfect first first thing to say when someone says, "How can I help you?" <laughs> so he laughed and said, "No, I can't do that." And then he said, um, after we talked for a little while, he said, "But I can teach you how to make it." And I thought, "Oh, that would be interesting." So. Before long, I returned with a couple of PhD chemists and we set up a laboratory in 1982 and um, right up here at the University of California, Santa Cruz campus. And we were making MDMA, pure legal MDMA. And I set out to do a study, a naturalistic study where I uh, would give it to people. I had a couple of partners. We would give it to people um, and ask them just to write down what it did. And the deal was that we wanted to keep this drug secret. We didn't, wasn't, it wasn't illegal. The DEA didn't even know about it. We wanted to build a, an underground base of therapists and people using it. And we started to do that. Dozens and dozens of therapists in the Northern California area were part of my project. And, um, and then my partner at the time <clears throat> met Rick and gave it to Rick please keep this quiet and just say what it does to you. Well, of all of the people, hundreds and hundreds of volunteers, Rick was the only one. He didn't um, 
he did not only did he not keep it secret, he called the government, he called the media, he called Reagan's drug czar to basically snitch us out and alert them to the existence of this not illegal quasi psychedelic love drug that was being used by dozens of therapists in the Northern California area and this group at Esalen. And he kind of inserted himself, he helped create the popularization of MDMA and, um, and basically made a career for himself. And then was only um, just like a year or two years after that, that it became, and Rick wasn't the only one, there were other, other um, players in this. And, um, and created it as a, a whole thing. Now you guys had mentioned the rave scene. Right. You guys were part of that. See, that I, was- I was, you never were, were you Danny? No, just me. <laughs> yeah. See, to me, that's an example of, again, this SOMA, MDMA, LSD, Huxley said LSD was gonna be a new SOMA, but Huxley didn't know about MDMA, but MDMA is like the perfect, Soma. Completely. And this rave, huh? Completely. Yeah. So this rave phenomena, all like it just kind of popped up all around the world. Warehouses on the edge of cities, all over the place, hundreds, sometimes thousands of young people taking this drug, which does have astonishingly effective therapeutic properties, mm -hmm. but not so much when you're taking it with that kind of mind numbing music. So here, here you have a drug that's extremely valuable that's being used to <clears throat> kind of anesthetize a whole population of young people. It's SOMA. Go back and read Brave New World and, and it's, it seems to me to be very clear. Now, yes, I know people will say, oh, but all this great stuff happened as a result of it. Maybe some great stuff happened as a result of it. But from my point of view, what happened is that MDMA became almost overnight the most popular recreational drug in the world. It, 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 it made billions and billions of dollars for the organized crime syndicates that were behind it. And if you do just a little bit of research, you can see that this is all Israeli intelligence. It's a Mossad operation. We know, we know for example, that many books have been written about how the CIA controls the heroin trade, how the CIA controls the cocaine trade, Gary Webb's book, um, uh, Alfred McCoy's book, The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia, how these intelligence agencies use, that's why these drugs are illegal. Well, that's exactly what happened with MDMA. Mm -hmm. That book hasn't been written yet, but um, it should be written because um, again, it's not an organic phenomena, kids getting together and having these parties. This was an operation that was engineered to make people just feel great to distract them from the political developments of the of the 80s and 90s well actually yeah. actually like so I, Dublin, part of that do you think Dublin was part of that Mossad Israeli intelligence and have you ever confronted him about ratting you guys out yes about you know because we were we were we kind of worked together for a little while in the beginning and then he kind of, you know, went around behind my back and did stuff. No, he had an agenda. And yes, I've, I've talked with him about it many times. He just flat out denies it. Um, but then occasionally he will um, slip and, um, and uh, offer evidence that supports my point. For example, <laughs> for example, in one of his fundraising letters back in um, 2011, he, he wrote um, about the greatest moment of his life. This is what he said. He said it was like one of the greatest moments of my life was finally being admitted into the secret headquarters of a, of a group. It was called the Hessig Foundation, H-E-S-G. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder what the Hessig Foundation is. And then just Google a little bit and you find out that the Hessig Foundation the board of directors are Mossad, the former head of Mossad. It's a, it's a front organization for Mossad. And their headquarters is in the Doblin's family's, Doblin's 
family's old mansion in Tel Aviv on Rothschild Boulevard. This is the family that he comes from. And okay. this is there, here he is just unabashedly saying, this is the most important moment of my life when they finally let me back into this thing for my work with MDMA. I mean, it was a phenomenally successful, yeah. continues to be a phenomenally successful operation. Okay, couple of billions and billions. Couple of questions, like so many things pop up here and there. I'm gonna say a couple of things, but first of all is this Doblin character is not someone who's popped up. I mean, maybe I've come across his name before, but he's not someone who pops up frequently in my lines of research. Um, and you just said when he was raising funds for his foundation. Now, is he associated with like Drug Policy Alliance or MAPS or something like that? Like which he's the found He founded MAPS. Okay, so I'm familiar with MAPS. I just, okay, I didn't, I, I guess I just have always referred to it as MAPS. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. My experience is that um, your handlers will always slip and tell you who they are. Right. So yeah. in my case, like I will often, I'm just, without naming who it is, I will have frequent conversations with someone who I've identified to be one of my handlers, where I will just straight up directly ask something like, you know, did yeah. you ever think maybe you were like working for an intelligence agency when you were doing all these things you were doing? And I'll get back and answer like, no, no. I interviewed for the CIA, but they turned me down. Yeah, that's, that's a very common thing. Right. They say, yeah, yeah, I know. Right. Okay. So like they can't help it. Right. Like literally. And, and then they're not with the others. Like I will ask them a question. They'll deny what I have asked them to happen, happen. But then in the very next sentence, they will give deeper evidence that I would have ever like dared to ask for. They'll give deeper evidence, you know, in the, in, in, the, in part of their denial of the first question I asked. Right. So I think this is uh, like a very, very uh, common phenomenon. Um, as to um, what you're saying about Mossad being involved with MDMA, while that's not something that had occurred to me before, that that resonates for me on a certain on a level that, you know, I'll go do some looking and some digging to sort of back that up. But sometimes I just go, and that one sounds right to me. Um, I actually think that. Um, because I was part of that scene. And I think while a lot of the music, from, a lot of electronic music is mind numbing, not all of it is, and some of it can be quite expansive, but that's rarely the kind that's popularly pushed. Um, and as far as MDMA, like being to sort of distract people from the politics of the 80s or 90s, I actually think it was more the long play, right? Because what I'm watching right now with the people who've been in the dance music scene, for as long as I have been, they are all what my friend Masaki calls branch COVIDians, right? It's a complete monoculture, right? They're all, you know, not only are they all left, but if you're not left, you're a racist and you shouldn't be allowed into our parties anymore if we ever have parties again, because we might have to stay home with a mask on our face for the rest of our lives, right? Yeah. There yeah. is almost no dissent even people who are like losing their livelihood and all of this kind of stuff, it's stay the fuck home, wear a fucking mask, vote for Joe Biden, right? So I heard more opposing opinions to, like I had friends in the rave scene in the 90s and in the early 2000s that were against George Bush, against the war, against, you know, that pushed back more, even some that were suspicious of 9-11 or whatever, right? Now, almost none, almost none. Uh, no, no people dissent from the popular, um, you know, Borg, you know, left wing controlled establishment corporate narrative. Yep. Kind of stuff. Right. Yep. And so, yeah, so I, I actually yep. so think we're seeing, we're seeing the same thing. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, so that's Rick. And then the press he gets is, you know, that's another way that you can tell because Operation Mockingbird, we mentioned earlier, it didn't go away in the, in the 1950s. Operation Mockingbird is, alive and well. is uh, stronger than ever. Yeah. It's alive and well. Yeah. Yeah. Is so, are the um, involved in this Mossad stuff as well? Are the who? You can who? Get out. The Shulgins. Well, uh, you know, Alexander Shulgin, Sasha, who I loved. I mean, I was, I was part of that scene up in Marin for, you know, quite a few years. 
Um, and yes, I think so. You know, Sasha, Sasha himself was a member of the Bohemian Grove. <laughs> um, Sasha worked for, uh, published many papers. Some of them might even be, um, there, there may have been secret research with MDMA in the 1950s. And, um, and uh, I wasn't the only one who Sasha taught to make MDMA. He not only taught me how to make it, he showed, me, showed us where to get the uh, precursors off the books. And um, Sasha was involved in the, um, in the first wave in the 60s and 70s, which he was, he was the teacher of the famous Leonard Pickard, who was the chemist, the acid chemist in the nuclear missile silos. That's a whole nother story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I, I, you know, I hesitate to say this. It's hard for me to say this because I really enjoyed Alexander Shogun. I mean, such a brilliant and, um, you know, funny character, a raconteur. And, um, you know, he was, you know, I wouldn't say that Sasha was a fascist, but um, he sure had a lot of fascist friends. I mean, the Bohemian Grove, you know, he used to just say, oh, I just play the cello for them in their band. But, you know, I, I just wonder about that. And, um, and so, you know, it's tricky. He just, he was a scientist who just loved science. He had a carte blanche. He could do whatever he want with psychedelic drugs. And, um, you know, more than any other single person is responsible for, you know, just a flood of these mind altering chemicals that, um, you know, some of them have positive, powerful effects. But if you look at his books like Pical and Tical, which are formulas and recipes, you know, and kids and people all around the world are experimenting with these drugs. They're mostly, you know, and I know I lose a lot of my, my readers and the audience that I'm trying to reach by saying things like this. They, they have more of a, you know, derangement and a, a, a distracting quality than they do have the quality that um, um, is healing for the culture. And like, like you're noticing with um, your rave community friends in the monoculture. So a couple of things, and, and then I have a thought about how where, where to maybe go with, with some of this. Um, so what you just said about how he, you're not the only one that he taught to make um, at MDMA. Yeah. So, one of the things that I've noticed is what they'll do with something like this. So first of all, like there is um, like, <laughs> this can kind of go both ways, right? There is an ethical, like, th like th there's a high ethical mark in a certain level for the fact that he taught you how to make it as opposed to just gave it to you, right? Like there is something about a holistic understanding of a substance, right? That when you actually make, and this goes for like, if you grow your own vegetables as opposed to just buy them at the farmer's market or whatever, right? So he did this thing, which really speaks to maybe his true nature and love of science and the experimental process and teaching someone and whatnot. But you know, so that that's one of those things that's like, okay, well, that's, that's kind of interesting. He did that. Um, but the other thing that happens when you know how to make something is you take sort of an ownership over it, right? Like, this is the way I do it. This is mine. Everyone sort of develops their own little style, right? They tweak the recipe or, you know, they have a certain ritual that they do when they're making it. They might listen to this music and some of that vibration or energy that is unique to you then goes into, you know, what you're doing. And that he taught a couple of different people enabled there to be possibly like, I'm, I'm just going from what I would intuit is happening, like a few different groups. So a few different cultures that develop around the, around the use of this substance, right? And so you find a few good students, each with different personality characteristics, quirks, different kind of charisma, right? And see sort of what develops. And it's, it's like, I refer to this as MK option, which is not a official program necessarily, but it gives them the option of going a number of different ways with things when you have a variety of groups that are having sort of similar, but slightly different, you know, um, uh, experiments going on based on the personality of someone who's sort of at the center of it, right? It's sort yes. of cult of personality around a substance. So it's like you become intertwined with that, right? So I think that's an interesting thing 
you know, that's been, that's been done. And I think you'll find that at the center of all of these sort of cultures that popped up around psychedelics. And you also see it in terms of like the cultures that pop up around um, yoga techniques, uh, dance music and styles of music that play are played and whatnot. And it gives them more laboratories, right? More sort of open air laboratories to um, tinker around with and observe and whatnot. And I think that like, when you look, you'll see this process over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. And so um, I'm thinking <coughs> like you've brought up a, a number of um, names of characters that um, some are people who have been observing this are very familiar with, others less so, right? Like most people probably aren't super familiar with Frank Barron, right? And, and, and whatnot. Um, and like what I'm thinking is maybe we could kind of have like a couple of conversations or a series of conversations about getting to know some of these characters from your perspective. Because we've all read the press about them. Danny, go ahead. I, I was waiting till you were done. Okay. <laughs> I don't you. Okay. Um, so, you know, like we started getting into a little bit about Gordon Wasson. Um, and, and I, and I didn't, I don't think we quite had finished sort of fleshing that out. I have some interesting thoughts based on some other things you've said since then about possibly what was going on with Gordon Wasson. Um, but I don't know, like maybe there's, an, it, you had, since you had personal experience with a bunch of these characters, maybe like some, rather than trying to just put little bits together all the way through, we have some conversations around these characters because I think that like, you know, so much of what happens is people decide in their heads that either this character is good or bad and that's just the way it is. And they lose like the really most important information that is in the nuance around these people who are yeah. not necessarily all good or all bad. And, and when right. you do that, you don't understand how they're actually working and how intelligence is working through them. So. Right. That's kind of my thought. And Danny, what did you want to say and what do you think about that? Well, yeah, because yeah. I've been holding my Wasson question because we took so many different offshoot, offshoots. So I've, yeah. I have two thoughts. I'm still okay. curious about your relationship with Wasson because, or Wasson, because even hearing you speak about it, how he was, you know, an, an introvert or, and he took you under his wing and then there was this betrayal. And I am or if there's some sort of- Danny, you froze for a second. So just repeat like the last sentence or so. Okay, so um, in regards to your relationship with Wasson, I'm curious as far as the ever unfolding MK story, if Wasson was a sociopath, if Wasson was a, facet, a fascist, if something else was moving through Wasson, because I'm trying to understand where the humanity gets co-opted by these larger agendas. Mm -hmm. And then my other question is, and this might be for, for another moment or another show, but how you see fascism through the psychedelic movement, you know, fr from Leary's time and now through through maps and today. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a lot, that's a lot of conversations. That's, yeah. uh, that's a I book. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so, to just go to Wasson, I've of course spent a lot of time wondering about this because when I was with him, and this is in his last, uh, you know, his last three or four years, he seemed, um, you know, he just seemed like a wonderful guy. You know, he didn't, there wasn't anything hostile or cruel or controlling. He seemed like a man who was, was um, you know, kind of comfortable with his fame and having introduced this stuff, you can see that if you look at his books, he produced a, a number of books, uh, half a dozen or so books, of uh, very, very high quality printing and publishing and scholarly merit. And um, I was really shocked when um, a few years after he died and I was um, going through his archives, which were then at Harvard, and I began to look at his correspondence and found his, mm -hmm. his proximity to Alan Dulles. Now, Alan Dulles, who I already had known because I had done a pretty thorough research into the Kennedy assassinations, and Dulles was um, you know, a central character there, and they were drinking buddies. And Wasson's story just began to fall apart, that, that the CIA didn't, he wasn't, connected with them. They were close. And um, so I don't, I don't really know, but I, I want to think, 
I want to think that Wasson might have had some regrets. I have other letters of him where he was writing about um, to his banking colleagues about the Vietnam War and how this was a he was an anti-war guy. He didn't like Reagan. He didn't like the Republican hawkish politics of the of the 1980s. He seemed like a gentle man who was really just interested in a scholarly way in his theories about the origin of religion. And um, so I, um, I don't know if I'm really answering your question. I don't really know. I don't, I don't think of him as, um, you, know, um, you know, these guys are true believers. You know, they, um, Shulgin too, like there wasn't anything nasty about him. I can't imagine him ever wanting to hurt somebody. That Shulgin's and Wasson, kind of the same, that they that if you just put this stuff out there, this was one of Wasson's phrases in my interview. He said, well, I just thought I'd put it out there and let the chips fall where they may. You know, that was, that was, his, that was his orientation. I don't, I don't really think he was malicious, but I think he was, you know, when, when you're a young man and you're offered a, a you know, a paid position, uh, that's a big deal. And you, you go along with it. When Leary was offered this position at Harvard, it was like a great thing. And now, and now he learns, oh my God, there's, there's a nefarious aspect to this puts you in a place like, what are you going to do here? And, um, um, you know, those are just two of the characters, but I, I like what Emily said to look at, to look at some of these people and to look at them from a, a neutral perspective. Terrence McKenna is another guy, yep. right? He's a little more part of the more kind of a famous celebrity status for your generation. Mm -hmm. Terrence is another guy who I, you know, I met, when I first got into the subject, I decided what I would do, partly with Frank's prodding. I organized a series of conferences at different places, Esalen, Harvard, uh, the University of California. I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago. I wanted to get real top people together and talking about these things. And these conferences then, you know, conversations started and they were they were instrumental in this modern psychedelic renaissance. So I met Terence in the context of one of these conferences that I organized in the early 1980s. And he was just like a really nerdy, brilliant, eccentric, unusually articulate kind of guy who I just really was attracted to because he not only had this, this you know, deep esoteric dimension about him, but he was also um, he had a family, he was, he had a beautiful wife, cat, these two gorgeous, creative children who were just like, uh, you know, four and five or six years old when we first met and, um, just super intelligent. We had these long conversations about how we were going to restart a psychedelic movement. We weren't going to make the same mistakes of the sixties. Mm -hmm. Terence was a big part of these conversations. But then as a, as a few years went by, Terence went from being this, you know, kind of nerdy sort of intellectual to um, hitting his stride and becoming a public speaker mm -hmm. and then becoming sort of famous. And then he sort of like tossed caution to the wind. And he really he really became like wanting people to take these drugs and encouraging people to take these mega doses of mushrooms and, um, and really became more interested in his celebrity stardom than, um, than in critical thinking. And then, um, and so again, this kind of pains me a little bit, but I think it's important for people who are seriously interested in this field to look at these things. When I look at the trajectory of Terence's life, I see tragedy that this, that this brilliant, you know, connected, grounded, gardener, ethnobotanist, family man with his feet firmly planted on the ground, but this esoteric access um, kind of all fell apart. A very ugly public divorce, the kids suffered, became like a fame seeking sort of, you know, teen bopper idol. Mm -hmm. um, he was dishonest in, in many um, 
important respects, like his advocacy of uh, taking huge doses of mushrooms, when actually, you know, Terence didn't do that himself. He kind of got the shit scared out of him in the early 1980s with high doses of mushrooms, and he didn't do that again. He would, he would turn people on to DMT, but he was, you know, not really that into it himself. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's a little disturbing. And uh, again, I say this with a kind of heavy heart because I was totally on his side. I was an important factor in, um, in the ayahuasca movement. I had some money that I gave him to help transplant ayahuasca from, uh, from Colombia and Peru to Hawaii. And now it's growing all over the place down there. And, um, and then I just began to realize, hmm. and I'm not making this up. And I think for people that really want to understand Terrence, one of the very best sources for that is his brother, Dennis, um, wrote a, 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 a thick book, a, a biography, his own biography, but his life with his brother. And it's called The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. Mm -hmm. and, and Dennis, is, it's a very honest portrayal of his own life and his relationship to his brother. And he, and he tells some things in there like this. I mean, he's just, uh, he loves him. He's his brother, but he's also honestly critical of some of his positions it kind of fanning the flames of uh, enthusiasm and um, and um, excitement about psychedelics, but really um, embodying what he knows. Robert, okay. We, this we is got, coffee, but then I'm drinking, by the way, not beer. Well, we got most of what you said. The last sentence or so was a little bit too distorted to understand, but I think we kind of, you know, got most of what you said. So um, based on a lot of the things that you've said here, like, first of all, even just what you said, just going back for a second about Gordon Wasson, I started just looking up. I didn't know he'd written so many books. I started looking up what his books were, and I already have plenty of lines that I could go down that I think would might be interesting for myself and hopefully for listeners to, to uh, listen to and for me to throw some spins on, do my little theorizing and see what you think about it. Um, so maybe what I'm thinking we should do is stop here for now, um, stop here for now for today and like come back and do, we can do a segment on Gordon Lawson, a segment on Shulgin, a segment on Terrence and whatever, and kind of do some of these deeper looks with the sort of idea in mind that we're taking a neutral look because we're looking for the nuance in order to really understand how this works. Like my, my view of Gordon Lawson up to this point had been basically, um, if you listened to some of the Terrence McKenna recordings, you'd think Gordon Wasson was great. If you listened to Jan Irvin and Joseph Atwill, you'd think that Gordon Wasson was the cause of every problem that we now have, right? It's very polarized and lacking in certain degrees of nuance. Um, and I'd like to take that more nuanced look. Um, are you amenable to that, Robert, Danny, whatever? Do you sure. like that idea? Yeah. I am. I am so wanting us to do a show on autism is using the psychedelics and how that's manifesting in our culture from beginning to end. So yes, to I, these, to, watch, to McKenna and whatnot, but I really, really, really want to know that piece, which I understand is probably like a series of books. Robert. Okay, <laughs> something you, you you distorted right at the beginning of that. So I, I, I missed the actual point of what you said. So what, what? <laughs> on board to take a neutral look at these players and these luminaries in the psychedelic movement. And I also really, really, really want to know how fascism yes. is manifest in our culture through the psychedelic. That feels so pressing for us to know. Yeah, I agree with you because it's interesting. Most people think of fascism as a right-wing phenomenon, right, mostly. And you don't often hear too many people are known as right-wingers also being involved in psychedelics. And since everything else has been an inversion of reality, it seems likely to me that we could, th this idea that fascism is really, is, uh, you know, um, infiltrated our culture through a psychedelic movement and possibly more left leaning, not with the polarized judgment situation, but through some of these, you know, 
a different a different came in from a different direction or with different different sort of yeah. uh, facets or features um i like yeah. that idea so i I'm, I'm i like that idea as well yeah yeah well so are you guys familiar with the important book by um um francis i think her name is stoner funnily enough um uh it's called uh, who paid the piper no it's about oh jot that down because that's a very important book and you know you know like it's becoming more known that um the CIA, the social engineering division of the CIA, was a very influential part in the um, modern art movement. Yeah, totally. Okay, so this this is an example. This is very similar to the psychedelic thing. I mean, we what don't was the name of the book? Francis Stoner. Uh, who paid the piper? Okay, thank who you. Who paid the piper? And it's about a, a CIA. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. What's your question? Well, Ooh, I didn't hear the last part of, a lot of people don't know that the CIA played an important part of, I didn't, it got garbled. The modern the social art engineering movement. part of the, Yeah. Okay, the, the, great. The modern, the modern art movement. Okay, so here's okay. the mod here's modern art, you know, this kind of eccentric, free flowing, spontaneous, um, whole, you know, zeitgeist of modern art. It's sort of the opposite of what we think of in terms of fascism or, you know, Hitler's and you know, all the Germans in straight lines. And here it is like all this eccentricity and so on. But how, how that serves fascism. It's a, yeah. it's a public re relations move by the social engineers so that no one would mistake America for becoming fascist when we had these you know, crazy movements like modern art or psychedelics, but actually they're being controlled from the top down. Ralph, yeah, I'm not familiar with her, so thank you for turning me on to her. I'm gonna take a look at that, but the, the, the idea that you're talking about, I am very familiar with that, that the, the introduction of both modern and quote unquote deviant art as a tool of fascist mind control is something I have yeah. looked into a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, <clears throat> So we're just throwing things out here. Um, you mentioned two people that I um, that I know quite well. Uh, you mentioned Jan Irvin, mm -hmm. and then you mentioned Joseph Atwill. Mm -hmm. And I I got to know both of those guys. Jan Irwin contacted me many years ago, mm -hmm. and um, he was such a hostile, yep, negative kind of guy. I just wouldn't give him the time of the day, but he kept on calling me and kept on calling me because he knew my relationship with all these people. And then finally he sent me a book he wrote mm -hmm. called um, something about the mushroom that he wrote about John Allegro's yeah. work. Yeah, Sacred Mushroom. It's an Allegro. excellent yeah. book. Yeah. It's an excellent book. And so I, I began to converse with him and share documents. Mm -hmm. and, and Jan introduced me to Joseph mm -hmm. Atwill. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then my relationship with Jan really began to deteriorate. Yep. And um, I don't want to say very much about it because I was, I was sort of a, a mentor to him, a sort of a counselor to him. And there are things that I just don't want to get into, you know, I developed a system of the op that he's wanting to expose. Mm -hmm. And he has certain psychological characteristics that are very yep. challenging to him. So I, um, yeah. And then he, he introduced me to Joe, Joe Atwell and they're like completely opposite people. Mm -hmm. And they, they, now they have absolutely no relationship. Yeah. So they're often, they're often named together because they've written yep. a couple of really good articles, Manufacturing the Deadhead. Yep. That's some, that's some really good work. It's mostly Joe's work that Jan was helping him with in the research. And then, you know, they had a real falling out. But, um, so, so, so Robert, I, you know, I am, I followed Jan Irvin's work for many, many years. Um, I don't anymore because my feeling is uh, exactly what you think that like he, is fallen prey to that which he was, he was trying to expose based on certain characteristics and tendencies and whatnot, um, and he's lost the plot. Um, but 
some of his early work particularly was very influential on me and he's been right about a lot of things, but yeah. I, you know, he's more, to me at a certain point, it became more important that he be right than that we actually learn anything. Um, and and yeah. that nuance that I'm talking about, right? I'm lo a lot less familiar with Joseph Atwill. The only way that I really know him is because once he became involved with Jan Irvin and I watched a lot of their work together, you know, and, um, you know, I've seen him been interviewed other places. It, it just held less appeal to me, not because there's anything wrong with it, just, you know, certain people's work, you know, resonates more for you than others, but I'm familiar with what happened between them. Um, but I do think that they showed some very interesting things, both individually and when they worked together. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's um, unfortunate <laughs> what's happened with 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 yawn but that's what I'm kind of really talking about is like I feel like you we can kind of pull back here and be a little bit more neutral and that we're not trying to necessarily prove someone is good or bad or you know or whatever our personality preferences are because that keeps us from understanding how it actually works and then we sort of fall prey to having it happen to us to us yes. as well yeah, that's, yeah. What I, that's what I meant at the beginning of the conversation to really get into this complex multi-layered topic. I mean, there's psychedelic drugs They, you know, people that are going to tune into this, they've probably yeah. taken these drugs. They have very, very powerful effects. There's a yeah. lot of emotionality um, and they, you just have to learn how to deal with that. And, and um, so, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there because I have, I have immense respect for Joseph Atwill and his, and his scholarship and particularly his book on um, Caesar's Messiah which is another, you know, um, it kind of epitomizes what we're talking about here with psychedelics is the creation of Christianity as mm -hmm. a psyop is very similar to what we're talking about here with the introduction of psychedelics mm -hmm. that Watson, Watson and, and team of social engineers in the 40s and 50s were looking to recreate a new age religion mm -hmm. to be, you know, the, the opiate, so to speak, of the masses. And that's what we can see, you know, nowadays, um, you know, especially now this quickening, this last election, you know, that we had, um, you know, not, not only the, the political stuff, but the, the, the uh, flowering of psychedelic culture is reached a crescendo never before in the world. Mushrooms everywhere. And um, I really want to encourage people to go back and look at Huxley's Brave New World because that's what we're becoming. I think it's interesting that you mentioned the election and obviously we're wrapping up and we're not going to go down that viper pit rabbit hole, but how the election was such that not a lot of people noticed how many drugs were legalized in so many parts of the country that day. Yeah. Yeah. Legalize is maybe not the right word, but, um, you know, brought to the fore. Yeah. I just I just have a certain thing with that phrase legalization, like, you know, people are under the impression that yeah. um, Rick Doblin is about legalizing MDMA. No, he's not about legalizing MDMA. He's about controlling MDMA. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, cannabis is not legal in California. It's, it's more illegal now than it was before Proposition 64. So they're just, you know, the language has become sort of a weapon here. And um, we want to we yeah. want to be mindful, there, but that but also I want to add there are genuine decriminalization movements, and that's different than you know the the corporatization and commodification of psychedelics is different than the decriminalization. Like yeah. in Santa Cruz, you can't profit, you can't sell mushrooms, but you can grow them. You know you can use them, you just can't um, you know market them, and so. It's a big subject. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for making that differentiation because I get that it's massive. Yeah. 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 A... Go ahead. I'm just, I just want to say again, it's not like we're talking about one family of drugs, but there are different movements within it that have opposite purposes. Yeah. It's like, you know, you could say it's not unusual to drugs. I mean, uh, sex is like this. There's one phenomena of sex. You know, it's like the most beautiful thing that people do with each other, but it is also the most, you know, there's a really diabolical aspect to how, you know, sexual power is um, manipulated and exploited and used for satanic and demonic 
purposes. Absolutely. And I think the same thing, the same thing could be said about technology, AI, social media, all that kind of stuff, right? Like they all have various intents and, and movements within the, the, you know, actual thing themselves. Go ahead, Danny. Sorry. And also just acknowledging how many different ops are at play simultaneously, because there's what you're talking about, decriminalization of certain substances, certain substances being decriminalized so they could be controlled. And then there's what just happened in Oregon, where now heroin and cocaine and meth are, it's all fair game where you look at, okay, that op seems to be the total destruction of that state um, yeah. and how they're all kind of intersecting and people tend to conflate them into one, but it seems like, no, there, there, there are many different ops serving many different functions. Well, and the exactly. one that was most yep. interesting to me and that nobody talked about was the legalization of mushrooms for recreational use in Washington, DC, right? And, and I'm, I'm busy whipping up a theory on why I think that is. <laughs> well, I'm curious what it is. I, 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 I need to flesh it out a little bit more. Okay. Um, and, and it, it, but I think this could actually wind in, like work its way into a general sort of more broad theory of like the various um, dimensions or realities created by each of these chemical compounds or substances. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, you know, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm sort of working on one strain and when I'm able to uh, put it together eloquently, then I will, then yeah. I will say it, but I, yeah. I can't wait to be able to do that first. But that's one that most people missed. I haven't heard anybody talking about that. And I think the fact that that happened in Washington, DC, right? Like is, you know, for, for the first place that, you know, recreationally legalized it, they're not even talking about having to do it in clinics or, or you know, for spiritual or, or psychiatric healing or whatever. They're just like mushroom sprawl, right? Um, so yeah. Robert, on once you're at the place where you can put it together in a cohesive, eloquent way, because that'll be such a fun three-way combo. <laughs> yes. Well, that's what that's why one of the reasons I'm I'm so excited about talking about stuff like this with you guys and um, Danny, a, a more highly trained writer, and to begin to get this stuff out. Joe Atwell and I have talked about writing a book together about all this, but you know, there are millions and millions of people involved in this operation. Um, and it's, uh, I feel responsible to help um, at least share my point of view, which is quite studied. And, uh, and I love the drugs, I, uh, the, the sacred, you know, you mentioned that before, Danny, and I appreciate you mentioned, it. that's actually the first sentence in my first book entheogens and the future of religion, where I make that distinction between um, what's a drug and what's the sacred substance. And, yeah. and uh, you know, the language is extremely important. I think each of us here really appreciate the experience that each of these various substances offer, and also are very clear on what some of the possible side effects, issues, downsides, whatever, of not just the substance, but really more the all the nonsense that goes on around it. Yeah, I've also been inspired lately by how many people like the. I'm I'm really just starting to come out because a lot of my work over the years was um, illegal, and underground, and um, and now I'm coming out more. Um, Facebook is really my only platform or presence. Um, I'm going to change that soon. But I'm impressed with how many people reach out to me and have heard one or another podcast and offer me information about um, what they've observed. That, that there's growing numbers of people mm -hmm. that are aware of this critical perspective of psychedelics and aren't being duped by the mainstreaming of them. And so uh, that also inspires me to come out more and to, um, and to share my, my point of view. So that's where people who have listened to this and are interested in following your, your, your work and your rantings and ravings and all that kind of stuff can find you. Is that Robert Ford on Facebook? Yeah, that would be the best place for now. And um, where can you know, like I said, I just went. Hmm? Where can they find your books? Well, my books are, um, God, I hate to say this, um, you can get them on Amazon, but um, I'd rather you go to your local bookstore. Um, 
my first book is called uh, Entheogens and the Future of Religion. <clears throat> and it's based on um, their, their papers from, it's an edited volume of original papers by the leading people, uh, Terence and Sasha Shulgin and Albert Hoffman and you know, I don't know, there's 20 or so contributors uh, that drew, I drew from some of the conferences that I organized in the early 1980s. I was very flattered that my, um, my friend and inspiration and teacher, Houston Smith, one of the great scholars of religion, says that's the best single inquiry into the religious significance of psychedelic plants and drugs. So that's, that's a book. And I originally did that book to be a, um, well, uh, first I did it with Stan Groff, but then I, when I began to realize that some of this movement wasn't what I thought it was, I withdrew it from publication and then brought it out 10 years later when um, this group called the Council on Spiritual Practices got going, which is the group that is behind the research at Johns Hopkins University. So it was originally a fundraiser for, um, for that Johns Hopkins project. But then I also developed a kind of curious view about that. But anyway, that's one, that's one book. Can we just, did a book. So I, I'm just curious about your curious view because Johns Hopkins is so questionable in terms of intelligence and what they're doing. So is that group clean? That's, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not sure. I would like to. I'd like to know more. I, you know, there are some. There are some funny things about it. Um, I'm a little shy about saying them right now, but let me just think. Of, well, I mean, this is this is now becoming known. Like that whole project was spearheaded by a very very brilliant man, who uh, I met in the early '90s, whose name is Bob Jesse. Uh, super smart, um, very nerdy, uh, electrical engineer, genius who before he got interested in psychedelic drugs was a vice president of business development at Oracle Software. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but, um, I, didn't, I didn't really get, figure that out until later. Oracle Software was, of course, started with CIA venture capital. And yeah. maybe the CIA just started Oracle Software and then just didn't have anything to do with it after that, maybe, or yeah. maybe there, are, maybe there are other operations. You know, I don't know, and I, I haven't ever really discussed this with Bob, who became a you know a friend of mine and a colleague. But he started that whole Johns Hopkins thing, and um, so there's very good reasons to wonder just what you're wondering, and that's what I'm doing. Yeah. The second book I did. The second book I did because it uh, was about Timothy Leary. When I first got interested in the whole subject of psychedelics, as I said, Tim was the bad guy. And we had to like not repeat the mistakes of Tim Leary. And, and I met Tim early on and I thought he was kind of a you know, self-important fool. And I was just buying that story until I, um, <clears throat> I realized some really disturbing things about Albert Hoffman um, and his um, anti-Semitism and stuff. And anyway, I went to, down to hang out with Tim for a weekend and I got a whole nother point of view of Tim. So I decided to publish a book about him, his memorial volume, and it's called Outside Looking In. And it's, it's a really fun book where I just had his um, contemporaries write about his legacy and what it was like to know him. So that's another book I did called Outside Looking In. And then I decided to republish Wasson's books. So I got the copyrights from the estate and um, began to come out. I came out with a new edition of one of his most important books. But then when I realized he was part of the fascist movement and made, I spoke at a conference and said that I found my, my copyrights were withdrawn by the Wasson estate. So um, that's <laughs> another part of the story, but yeah. Anyway, those books, Entheogens and the Future of Religion and and Timothy Leary outside looking in, there's a lot of good material in those. All right, well, I think you've established your credentials as a 
an, a curious seeker, which is the only thing required for this series of conversations that I would like to have with you. So I want to thank you for uh, for joining us today. And um, Danny, any, do you have any last thoughts? Just thank you so much for joining us. You're just a Trevor tre treasure trove of just the type of, of intel and information and pattern connecting that we love to geek out on. So I am just had so much fun. I'm so excited to have you on again. Yes. My pleasure. It's a real pleasure to, to uh, connect with you guys. And I look forward to more. And um, now I'm going to go down to the bookshop Santa Cruz and get that copy of Best of Me and um, flip through it before I mail it to you. <laughs> All right. That wraps it up. Okay. That wraps it up for us here today. We will hope for slightly better um love from the technical gods next time i apologize for some there's a few technical interruptions and distortions here we'll hope for better luck next time and uh we'll see you guys real soon okay great bye guys